Welcome back to Physical Anthropology. In the last chapter, we introduced you to the concept of human variation and the idea of populations rather than races. In chapter 14, we're going to look at human variation from an adaptive significance approach. First, I'm going to explain to you the difference between adjustment versus adaptation. And then I'm going to give you specific human examples that relate to adjusting or adapting to different temperatures, higher altitudes, different amounts of sunlight exposure, various infectious diseases, as well as drinking milk. Adaptation is something that is genetic. So it's the idea that a trait has become more common as a result of natural selection. This is gonna happen at the population level. In comparison, adjustment is something that an individual can do to help fit into a new environment. So it's a non-genetic way to deal with certain types of environmental stress. And it's going to usually be a short-term way of adjusting to that climate until they return back to their traditional climate. Some of these can be behavioral adjustments. Some are acclimatory, meaning that you do have biological changes, but it happens in your own body and it is not genetic. And then there can even be developmental changes for people who live in those new environments for long periods of time. So the first example we're gonna look at is temperature. It's very important for humans to have thermal regulation. That's because we are an endothermic type of animal. That means we're warm blooded. So just like all of our mammal relatives, we need to maintain an internal, internal temperature. And for humans, this is at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So what happens if the external environment is too hot or too cold? If it's too cold, some adjustments that your body will make include increasing your basic metabolic rate, your basal metabolic rate. It also includes increase of shivering. That means your muscles are contracting uh, without your control, and this increases the amount of heat production. We also see vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction uh, is basically the idea that these blood vessels in the peripheral part of the body are going to constrict to shunt the blood more into your core. So this means your core temperature remains warm, especially where your vital organs like your lungs and your heart are. Also, of course, your brain, those organs take priority and your peripheral body parts will be cooler. This, of course, long-term consequences could result in things like frostbite and even necrosis of the tissue if blood flow is not returned. But as a short-term adjustment, it works. And of course, we do have behavioral adjustments such as putting on warmer clothes. In fact, our human ancestors have been wearing clothes for thousands of years and our more distant relatives would have had more fur and lived in warmer climate. Then on the right, we see the response to too much heat. So we do wanna stay at 98.6, but we don't wanna get much higher than that. If you have a fever, that's a temporary situation where you're trying to fight off a pathogen but otherwise you don't wanna to get too hot. And so you're going to react to heat by sweating, which causes you to lose heat through your skin by evaporation of the water. And we also see the opposite uh, effect. Instead of vasoconstriction, we'll see vasodilation, which is that your peripheral body parts will have increased blood flow to lose heat through radiation. And you can see that sometimes in people with lighter skin, you'll see that they're flushing kind of reddish or pink uh, after, for example, exercise. Next, let's look at adaptations to temperature. So again, these are going to be long-term genetic changes. In cold temperatures, you're more likely to have higher mass to surface area ratio. That's because smaller animals are going to lose heat faster while larger animals are less likely to lose heat. And this actually follows Bergman's rule, which says that species of a smaller size tend to be found in warmer climates and species of a larger size tend to be in the colder climate. You definitely see this in many animal examples. Um, here are two species of deer. The reindeer live in colder environments and are larger. You also see this with bears. Uh, things like brown bears are relatively small compared to their polar bear relatives, which live in the Arctic. In comparison, at hot temperatures, we want to increase the surface area uh, to help dissipate heat. So what does that mean? You might actually be the same mass as another individual, but you're going to be taller, thinner, narrower. 
A good example of this is Allen's rule, which has to do with the body volume to surface ratios. And you can see in these rabbits, three different types of rabbits. The Arctic rabbit is going to be more condensed with smaller appendages and smaller ear versus the rabbit that lives in the desert here is going to be very lanky, uh, very long, thin limbs, really long ears also help to dissipate heat. Another interesting adaptation specifically for humans is going to be the differences in nose shape. So for our lungs to function properly, we need to humidify the air before we breathe it in. And we also don't want the air to be too cold. And so we need to warm it up. And the four nose types uh, indicated in this picture show the difference between those who live in hot versus cold climates and dry versus wet climates. So the lepterine nose is more for a cold, dry environment. And what that one is showing you is, um, this is lepterine here, is that you tend to have a longer, narrower nose to give enough time for the air to be warmed up and humidified before it reaches the lungs. In comparison, the platyrine nose is more common in a hot, wet environment. Think of like a tropical environment where you have a broader nose, and that is because the air is already humid and does not need to be humidified further. Then on the right hand side, we see Bergman's and Allen's rules applied specifically to human body shapes. And we see that a person who is of Inuit origins, uh, they live in very cold environments. So they tend to be shorter, stockier. They also have more uh, body fat to help maintain their temperature versus the person on the right who's a Sudanese, that's in Africa, very hot climate. They're very tall and thinly proportioned. Next, let's look at what happens at higher altitudes. So first we can look at some adjustments. If you travel to a high altitude, your body will make some compensation for that. So in general, higher altitudes are gonna be much colder, drier, and there's a lot less oxygen at the top of a mountain. Most people, most populations actually live along the coast of the continents. And so they live close to sea level. If you travel up to a mountain, some things you should expect to see will be increased breathing, increased breathing rate and increased heart rate. This is going to be to try to get oxygen to your organs. Over longer periods of time, you can also have modifications to your blood. So this will take a little bit longer, but what will happen is that you might produce more red blood cells and you might produce more hemoglobin and you might produce um, more capillaries to help with this transportation of oxygen. On the right hand side, we see some developmental adjustments. These are people who actually grow up at high altitude. So if you have a baby at high altitude and they live there for long periods of time, um, they're going to actually go more slowly and physically mature later, but they're going to have larger heart and lung capacity than someone who lives at sea level. The individual on the uh, right picture is actually um, a lady who lives in the Andes mountains. And next we're gonna talk about what indigenous populations have that's different from people who don't live at high altitude. So there are some genetic adaptations, including genes that code for more red blood cells and higher levels of hemoglobin. There are a couple of populations, as I said, the Andes Mountains, this is in South America, where people have lived in these very high mountains for many generations. We also see it in Eastern Africa, and then of course the Himalayan Mountains. So my first review question for you, well, actually I already answered it, <laughs> sorry. So the answer is already there, but the question was supposed to be in hot temperatures, what is it called when there's an expansion of the capillaries to help uh, transfer heat? And the correct answer for that is vasodilation. Now, do you remember what the opposite word is for when we constrict capillaries? So the opposite would be vasoconstriction. My next question, acclimatory adjustments that occur at high altitudes include all of the following except A, increased speed and depth of breathing, B, decreased heart rate, C, increased number of capillaries, or D, modifications to red blood cells. So all of these are true except for the decreased heart rate. You're more likely to see increased heart rate. 
Next, we'll look at adjustment versus adaptation of skin tone. We have talked about skin tone before and the idea that it is a cline. So it's not like there's only dark skin and light skin. There's a lot of intermediate stages in humans. And we see that the further distance you are from this equatorial zone, the further you go north, the lighter your skin tone tends to be. So what's going on with that? Well, first of all, it is a form of natural selection. Uh, that's because melanin protects you from the UV light and having too much UV light would cause you to develop things like skin cancer, which of course would uh, potentially be fatal. It also destroys an important nutrient called folate, which is necessary for the development of the nervous system. On the other hand, if you live in more northern latitudes, it's better to have a lighter skin because we need some radiation to penetrate the skin for vitamin D synthesis. And that's gonna be important for healthy bones. So this actually follows not just in humans, but in other mammals as well. There's something called Gloger's rule, which is that uh, those who are more darkly pigmented tend to be closer to the equatorial zone, while the lighter ones tend to be further from the equator. Obviously, there's going to be some variation there. For example, what's going on with their fur. Uh, fur does protect you more than just naked skin. And it's also possible that additional selective pressures occur, such as the need for camouflage or for sexual signaling or some other reason for the coloration of the fur. And then finally, I want to talk about adjustment. Adjustment is something, again, that would happen to an individual, and that would be something like developing a tan. So if you are generally light-skinned, but you go out in the sun and you start developing a tan, that's something that's happening in reaction to the sunlight, but your genetics will determine the range of possibility for your skin tone. So it's your genetics that will determine how light or how dark you can potentially become, and then it's the environmental effect that will allow you to move between those ranges. How does melanin actually work? It's pretty interesting. Melanin is a type of protein that's produced by specific cells called melanocytes. And these melanocytes are found at the base of your skin. So for example, this is uh, the surface right here. So the light would be penetrating downwards. And you can see there are many cells here. Okay, these cells are the actual skin cells. Those are called keratinocytes. But at the very base, we have this large, almost octopus looking cell. That is a melanocyte. And the melanocyte produces the pigment. As it produces the pigment, the pigment leaves the cell and starts to go further up into the skin layers into these other cells. But it is not the keratinocytes that are producing the pigment, it's the melanocytes. And how many melanocytes you have is determined by your genetics. Furthermore, whether they're activated or not can be determined by the exposure to sunlight. And there are different types of pigments that it can produce. So eumelanin is a more brown to blackish color while theomelanin is a more pink to reddish color. These same proteins can be found in hair, and that's because your hair follicles originate in skin. So what happens with hair is that uh, the skin cells <clears throat> are pushed into this conical shape, and there is pigment in those skin cells that comes out like hair. This explains why, in general, people with darker skin are also going to have darker hair, and then people with lighter skin are more likely to have lighter hair. But it's not a perfect system because there are other genes involved. It also explains why we do see things like red hair in humans in addition to brown and black hair. And then something like blonde hair would just be a very little amount of pigment rather than a lot of brown pigment. This picture is showing you what will happen if you don't get enough UV light. So UV light is necessary for the body to produce a special vitamin called vitamin D3. And vitamin D3, along with calcium, is going to help build up strong bones. So if you are a child whose bones are still growing and you don't get enough of this vitamin, you'll end up with malformed bones. And you can see in these children, the disease called rickets, their legs are bowed out or inwards. That's because their body weight is putting a lot of pressure on relatively soft bones that are trying to grow. It can be reversed if you get to the child early enough. So if you start giving them vitamin supplements, then you can potentially straighten out the leg and have them grow more normally. This is just a summary from your book on the different types of, or different causes of skin coloration. And we talked again about that folate, the possibility of UV light destroying folate if you have too much, but we also need vitamin D production. So there's definitely a balancing pressure on that. 
Next, let's look at our evolutionary history with some infectious diseases. So malaria is a very dangerous parasite that's found in tropical environments. It's vector-borne, meaning it is transmitted from human to human through the bite of an insect, specifically a mosquito. So what happens is when the mosquito bites you, the parasite is put inside of your blood and the parasite will reproduce inside of your blood cells. And when it does that, it will burst these blood cells. So it can cause uh, basically anemia as well as fevers, as well as liver damage, depending on how much of the parasite you have. So it is dangerous, it can be fatal. And one of the adjustments that humans have made in terms of trying to fight this disease is controlling the mosquitoes. So by having mosquito nets around their beds, having mosquito nets on their windows, they help decrease the risk of being bitten. There's also pesticides that are used to kill the mosquitoes. And if you happen to be traveling to a location that has malaria, you may be recommended by your doctor to take prophylactic drugs. So prophylactic drugs means you take this oral medication and then if you are bitten by uh, a mosquito, the parasite can't reproduce inside of you. The same drugs can be used to kill the parasite inside of people who are already infected. But the problem with all of these adjustments is that if you've ever gone somewhere where there's mosquitoes, it's almost impossible not to get bitten. It's very difficult to avoid that. And you also don't wanna to have to take these prophylactic drugs for the rest of your life. You know, that would be expensive. And there's also always side effects to taking drugs. So what are some adaptations that human populations have against malaria? Well, because it's such a strong selective pressure, there are certain mutations that have become more common in people who live in these tropics. So the map on the top left is showing you the incidence of some of these different genetic mutations. Thalassemia is a genetic mutation that occurs in the hemoglobin molecule of your red blood cell. Then we have, of course, sickle cell anemia, which we've talked about. On the right, we show what happens with sickle cell anemia, which is that the normal shape of the red blood cell collapses into a sickle shape uh, due to the malfunctioning hemoglobin protein. So you might wonder, okay, these are bad genetic disorders. You get sick from it, why would you have it? And it has to do with natural selection. There's something called the heterozygous advan advantage. So people who are heterozygous only have one copy of the allele for telosemia or for sickle cell anemia. And what happens with them is they're more immune to malaria. So that increases their survival. On the other hand, if you're homozygous for these alleles, then unfortunately you develop the disease and then you have those side effects you might even die from the disease. So, and when I say disease, I mean the genetic disease rather than malaria. And then if you're homozygous without this gene, then you're just more likely to get malaria and die from malaria. So the heterozygous individuals were the ones most likely to survive. And that explains why these genes continue in these populations, even though the genetic disorder is potentially fatal. Another infectious disease we're gonna look at is HIV. So HIV, if you're not sure what it does, it's a virus that infects your immune system cells. And because it destroys the immune system cells, you end up dying not from HIV directly, but from a condition called AIDS, where you get opportunistic infections that are able to take over your body because your immune system can't fight them off. So HIV is definitely a fatal disease if you don't take medication for it. But what's really interesting is that some genetic studies have shown that people who are homozygous recessive for the CCR5 mutation, they have resistance to HIV infection. So you might wonder like, wow, that's so amazing. Where did the CCR5 come from? Well, if you take a look at the map, uh, you can see the concentration of this mutation and you see it a lot in Northern Europe. Now, since HIV has only been around, uh, we've only discovered it since the 1980s, but it's really only been in the human population for maybe about a hundred years or so, that's not enough time for natural selection to have increased this mutation. So what we think happened is that it was a different infectious disease, which also uh, you can be immune to it if you have this mutation. And what historical infectious diseases devastated Europe? Examples would be bubonic plague and smallpox. Bubonic plague, uh, maybe you've heard of the Black Death, was a disease spread by rats and fleas. And if it bit you, it would cause your lymphatic system to get infected and it was quite fatal. We estimate that during different plagues in European history, anywhere from 25% to 75% of the population died from bubonic plague. So there have been very strong 
uh, advantage if you were immune to it due to a CCR5 mutation. In addition to that, Europeans have another illness called smallpox. That one is caused by a virus and it spreads uh, through the air. So that one is very quickly contagious. The thing with smallpox is almost everyone in European history would have been exposed to it at some point. So there are going to be genetic mutations that help provide some immunity. Furthermore, we know smallpox is devastating because when people from Europe first traveled to North and South America and interacted with the natives, there, those people had never experienced things like bubonic plague and smallpox, and a huge number of Native Americans actually died off from infectious diseases because they didn't have any of these genetic factors that could offer immunity. So my review question for you is that rickets is characterized by inadequately calcified bones that are softer and more flexible than normal. Individuals with rickets may not have received enough vitamin blank during their growth and development. So which vitamin was it? And hopefully you remember that it is in fact vitamin D. This is something that you can produce in your own skin. However, in modern diets, we're also able to take vitamin supplements and get our vitamin D that way. So my last example for you is going to be the adjustment versus adaptation to drinking milk. Because humans are mammals, all mammal babies have the ability to drink milk when they are infants. This is part of our classification. However, the vast majority of mammals lose their ability to drink milk later in life. So that little cartoon um, of the cat loving to drink milk is actually not correct. If you give an adult cat milk, it most likely can cause it to have digestive upset. And many humans have that same situation where the gene for lactase the enzyme you need to digest milk is turned off later in life. So if that person consumes milk products, including uh, other dairy like ice cream or cheese, they will have digestive upset. That's called lactose intolerance. Many humans have that situation, but some humans have an adaptation called lactase persistence. What this means is that for some reason, the gene that produces lactase remains on throughout their life. And so they are able to drink milk as an adult. What we find, if you look at this picture, is that the incidence of this lactase persistence is strongly associated with a domestication history of animals that produced milk. So whether that was cattle or goats, humans who raise these animals and have drunk the milk for long periods of time, many generations, have developed lactase persistence. And that's because if you think about it, the nutritional value of being able to eat this extra protein source would allow you to survive and allow you to uh, reproduce. So there is that natural selection pressure there. Of course, we do have adjustments that we can do in modern society, which is if you wanna eat some ice cream, but you're lactose intolerant, you can buy a lactate pill. That's basically the lactase enzyme in a pill form, and you would eat that right before you consume your milk product, and that way you don't feel ill. However, that's a temporary solution and is not something that your own body can produce. And that's it for chapter 14.